hypothesis testing about a proportion. Uh, I'll remind you that last time we went through an example of hypothesis testing where we kind of made things up as we went along. So now I'm going to teach you the procedure that we were secretly following then. Uh, so we're going to talk about hypothesis testing about a proportion. This procedure applies when you're considering a binary categorical variable in a population and you want to know if it's plausible that the proportion of successes, whatever successes is in this case, the proportion of one of the outcomes is equal to or different from some proposed value. Remember there are five steps to hypothesis testing. The first step is identifying the hypotheses, the null and alternate hypotheses. You get these from the statement of the question. Uh, the most important thing you'll get from the statement of the question is what value you're comparing P to. So a, a specific proportion, which we'll call the test proportion, P0, will be either explicitly mentioned in the problem or implicitly mentioned in the problem. If it says you want to know if this is a fair coin, you have to realize that in a fair coin the proportion P of heads is 0.5. So there, the proportion you're comparing it to would be 0.5. So in each problem, P0 is a number coming from the question, and the null hypothesis is always the statement that P equals P0. The alternate hypothesis can be any of the statements P is less than, greater than, or different from P0, depending on what the question asks. Specifically, what are you looking for evidence and support of? That's always the alternate hypothesis. And here, a word about notation. In a specific problem, P0 will be a number. So the null hypothesis when you do a problem will always look like the statement P equals some number. P itself will, is always an unknown. It's always the thing we don't know. So it's always referred to by a variable. P0 in a specific problem is a specific number. So the null hypothesis is always P equals some number, and the alternate hypotheses could always be P is less than, greater than, or different from some number. The first two are called one-tailed alternatives, and the last one is called two-tailed alternatives. You'll see why in a moment. Step two in hypothesis testing is to give the sampling distribution. In our case, when it's a categorical variable, uh, the sampling distribution is the distribution of p hat. We remember that from lecture 16. So we're going to assume the null hypothesis. So we're going to assume that p is equal to that fixed proportion p naught, in which case we know exactly what the distribution of p hat is. It has a mean of p naught, a standard error of the square root of p naught, 1 minus p naught over n, and is roughly normal. So it looks like this crude picture here where the center of the normal distribution is at p naught, the standard errors are marked off. The third step, this is the heart of the procedure, is to calculate the p-value. You calculate the p-value using a norm dist calculation. There are three slightly different variations on this calculation depending on which alternate hypothesis you use. Uh, in, the, in case A, when you're testing the claim that P is less than P0, the p-value is simply normdist. The first entry, you put the p-hat from your sample. Here's where your sample data enters into it. The second entry is the mean of the sampling distribution, which remember was P0, assuming the null hypothesis. The third entry is the standard error, which in assuming the null hypothesis is the square root of P0 times 1 minus P0 over N and the fourth entry is always 1. This corresponds to asking what's the probability of getting the value we got, p hat, or less. Remember, you're always the p-value is your chance of getting data like you got. We got the value p hat, but like means at least as much evidence for the alternate hypothesis. If we're looking for evidence that p is less than a certain value, then even smaller values of p hat would be even more evidence. So that's why that little left tail region is what we're calculating. We calculate it with that norm dist. If the alternate hypothesis is p is greater than p0, we take 1 minus the same thing we calculated in a. That's the probability of getting greater than p hat, 
we've drawn it here as the right tail, and of course that's because anything bigger than your p-hat would be at least as good evidence for b being bigger than some value. And finally, here's the subtlest case. In the two-tailed alternative, if p is different from p0, you take twice whichever of the quantities in a or b is smaller. So you can explicitly say it's two times min is the Excel function, which finds the minimum of a list of values, two times the minimum of those two things, of the things you calculated in A and B. That corresponds to calculating the probability or the area in the two tails that emanate above and below p hat. That represents the probability of getting something as far from p naught or further, uh, which is all the things which would be even more evidence that the true proportion is different from p naught. This is a subtle point. If it's, I would not get hung up on it now. It would be easier to grok when you have gotten used to doing the calculation. So for now, you should just remember the norm dist calculation that you see in A is the basic thing you compute. You take either it if you're in the A case, or you take one minus it if you're in the B case, or you double whichever of those two is smaller if you're in the C case. If you do this a couple of times, it will seem pretty simple, even if it seems mysterious at this point. Step four is the conclusion. So remember, if your problem provides a significance level, if it is a formal hypothesis test or a significance test, then the conclusion is very straightforward. If the p-value is less than that significance level, the p-value you calculated in 3 is less than the significance level they gave you in the problem, then you write down the following conclusion. This data is significant evidence at the alpha significance level that the proportion of all, whatever the population is, which is whatever the variable is, is either less, more, or different from whatever p0 is, where less, more, or different is based on the alternate hypothesis. I am going to be awfully pedantic about writing your conclusion in this format. Uh, how you say the population or the variable, if you say it informally, is okay, but I am, uh, if you deviate too much from this formulation, I am likely to object. I should also warn you that this formulation is a little bit different from what you see in the book. The book uses a more old-fashioned terminology. When you find significant evidence, they describe that as rejecting the null hypothesis. So they'll often state their conclusions as we do or don't reject the null hypothesis. I find this awkward, confusing, and missing the point. So I will not use this, but you should be prepared to see that in, in your statistical future as well as in the book. Uh, this more modern formulation is how we'll do it. So if the p-value is less than alpha, you conclude the data is significant, blah de blah de blah if the p-value is greater than or equal to alpha, alpha, you write the exact same sentence, except you say it's not significant. If you're not given a significance level, if it's informal, your conclusion is informal. A very small p-value, let's say quite a bit less than 1%, is strong evidence for the alternate hypothesis. A big p-value, maybe more than 10%, is no evidence at all, and in between is in between. The only thing that I'm going to object to is you should not use the word significant unless you're use, doing a significance test, which means that the problem gave you a significance level. Step five is to check the assumptions. Here we're on pretty comfortable turf. You're used to this. There are three assumptions, and you know them. Simple random sample. You have to check that the question says that the sample is random. Large population or independence assumption you need the population to be at least 20 times the sample size. We often use capital M to represent the size of the population when we talk about it, which is rarely. And finally, the normality assumption is the rule of 15. Here, we can use P0 in place of P, which of course we don't know. Right? If we knew P, it would be N times P is at least 15, and N times 1 minus P is at least 15. In a confidence interval where we don't know P, but we do know P hat, we use P hat. In a hypothesis test, where all the calculations are done assuming that p equals p0, we can use p0. So apart from that slight wrinkle, this is exactly 
the assumptions you've always done for a categorical procedure. Okay, so let's actually do an example here and see what it looks like in practice. So here's my problem. We have, you take a sample of 120 customers and 78 of them say they, you give them two ads. Say they prefer the ad with the mauve color scheme over the one with the taupe color scheme. Um, whether or not they know what mauve and taupe are, which I certainly don't. We want to know, is this evidence at the 1% level that a majority prefer mauve? So here's a case where if I hadn't put the parentheses in there, the test proportion would have been implicit. Majority means more than 50%. So it's implicitly comparing to 50%. But before we get to that, let's think through what's the population variable and parameter. Stop and think about these and come up with your answer before you look at mine. The population is, of course, all customers. That's what we're taking a sample from. The variable is what we ask each customer. We ask them, do you prefer mauve or taupe? And the parameter is always the proportion, so it's the proportion of all customers who prefer mauve. Okay, now let's go through our process. Step one is to identify the hypotheses. So you first have to see what you're comparing your proportion to. So since we want to know, we're looking for evidence that there's a majority you have to understand that that means more than 50%. So your alternate hypothesis is that the percentage of customers who prefer mauve, or the proportion of all customers who prefer mauve, is more than 50%. So your alternate hypothesis is P is greater than 0.5. Okay? P, 0.5 is your test proportion. Greater than means we're using alternative B. Our null hypothesis is easy once you've got the alternate. It's that P equals 0.5. If you're not sure about the ultimate, alternate, you can do the null hypothesis first. Step two is to describe the sampling distribution. You assume the null hypothesis. So you assume P is equal to 0.5. We know that N is 120. So the sampling distribution of P hat is normal with a mean of P, 0.5 and a standard error, the usual formula, square root of p, 1 minus p over n, that's 0.5 times 0.5 over 120, which is 0.0456. So that's the sampling distribution. Step three is to calculate the p-value. Uh, this is a norm disk calculation. Here is a really good place to do a quick sketch of your normal distribution and check where your p hat is. Because this is a confusing calculation, you will usually, as soon as you mark where p hat is, you will be able to see whether or not it's significant. If it's far from p0, it's probably going to be significant. If it's close to p0, it's not. And you will catch a lot of errors if you think that way. In our case, p hat, that's what comes from the sample, is 78 over 120, or 0.65. It's the one place where the sample comes into this. So our p hat is 0.65. Our alternate hypothesis was b. p is greater than 0.5. So that means we use 1 minus norm dist. And in norm dist, we put p hat, p0. And I've written out in Excel the standard error. We take 1 minus norm dist of 78 over 120. We put in 0.5 in the second slot. We put in the square root of 0.5 times 0.5 over 120 in the third slot, 1 in the last slot. Here is a place where if you round off your calculation of the standard error and place the rounded number in there, your p-value may look quite a bit different from mine. Uh, the best way to avoid that and avoid possibly getting something incorrect is to put the exact formula in. Uh, this works out too when you do the norm disk calculation, 0.000508, or 0.05%. So that's our p-value. That's a tiny p-value. Our conclusion, we were given a significance level of 1%. The p-value is 0.05%. You can express both the p-value and the significance level as a percentage, or both as a decimal, and compare them either way just make sure you're consistent. The p-value is tiny. It's way less than the significance level. 
which means it is significant. So our conclusion is, this data is significant evidence at the 1% significance level that the proportion of all customers who prefer mauve is more than 50%. You can safely assume customers like mauve better. Presumably, you'll go with that when you buy the ad. And notice that this sentence gives the actual conclusion that it is significant evidence. It gives the significance level, and it gives the alternate hypothesis, which breaks down as a parameter, a population, a variable, whether they prefer mauve, an inequality, more than, and the test proportion, 50%. So all the important pieces of information are in that sentence. Step five, check the assumptions. Simple random sample, if you go back and look, the problem didn't say, so it's not met. Large population. We'd need there to be 20 times 120, which is 2,400 customers for or potential customers, presumably, for your company. That seems likely, if you're ever going to survive. And the rule of 15, we take n, which is 120, times p naught, which is 0.5. That turns out to be 60, which is plenty more than 15. Likewise, n times 1 minus p naught is also 60. That's more than 15. You can think of, if this is helpful, the two numbers that need to be more than 15 are the number of yes and no answers you would expect if the null hypothesis were true. If customers preferred mauve and taupe equally, then you would expect 60 yeses and 60 noes. Uh, you can ignore that if that doesn't seem helpful. All right, let's do a faster example where I won't talk quite as much. We want to test the claim at the 5% significance level that a proportion is different from 0.3 if a simple random sample of 80 had 21 successes. Okay, different from 0.3 means our alternate hypothesis is p is not equal to 0.3, and our null hypothesis is p is equal to 0.3. This is the case C, the two-tailed alternative, so we know the calculation is going to be a little bit trickier, and you'll get to see that. Step 2, sampling distribution. P hat is normal with a mean of 0.3 and a standard error of square root of 0.3 times 0.7 over 80, which is approximately 0.0512. Step three, this is the big step. Since it's a two-tailed alternative, we first do that norm dist calculation. Norm dist, first slot is your data, 21 over 80 is your P hat. Second slot is your test proportion. Third slot, your standard error using the test proportion. Fourth slot is one. That works out to 0.232. If we were in situation A, that would be our p-value. We're not. If we were in situation B, 1 minus that would be your p-value. 1 minus 0.232 is 0.768. If we're in situation B, 0.768 would be our p-value. We're not. So instead, we t in C, we take whichever of those is smaller and double it. 0.232 is smaller than 0.768, so we double it and we get 0.464. Okay? When you write out all three numbers, you always see a little number, one minus it, which is a big number, and twice the little number, which is the two-tailed alternative, in some order. Okay, our p-value is 0.464, or 46.4%. It's more than the significance level, which was 5%. I think 5%, not 0.3, was supposed to be highlighted there, sorry. So this is not significant evidence. Here we don't know exactly what the population and proportion are, so all we can say is this data is not significant evidence at the 5% significance level that p is different from 0.3. Okay, check the assumption. Simple random sample? Yep, it says large population. We don't know what the population is, but we know it would need to be more than 1,600 because it has to be more than 20 times the sample size. And the rule of 15 is met, because 80, the sample size, times p naught, which is 0.3, is 24. That's fine. And 80 times 0.7 is 56. That's fine. Here's what you should be able to do at the end of this lecture. You should be able to extract the null and alternate hypotheses, which includes figuring out what the test proportion is, from the question, and be able to write it in the symbolic form which is always h naught colon p is equal to some number, 
and aj colon p is less than, greater than, or different from that number. You should know how to calculate the p-value based on the sample proportion, um, as well as the test proportion, and which of the three alternate hypotheses you are using. You should know, this is from the last lecture, how to compare the p-value to the significance level and express your conclusion in a complete sentence. And you should know, this is really from lecture 16, how to check the three assumptions of the hypothesis test for a proportion. The only difference is, remember, you use the test proportion.